morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful Michigan fall day. I'm very sorry that you had to navigate road closures and weird parking locations. Um, we just found out two days ago from the city that all, all the streets around our museum were gonna be closed this morning. <laughs> we tried to get the word out and, and make uh, signage, so I'm glad everyone that's here made it and the roads are back open, so hopefully for the next sessions throughout the day, we'll see more and more people, um, but we're glad that you're here. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Um, so we're going to get started um, because we have a great lineup of speakers and I don't want to take another moment away from them. I'm Tracy Glab, Executive Director of the FIA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Enchanted, a History of Fantasy Illustration ex uh, Symposium for the exhibition. All right. Here we go. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Alan Klein for sponsoring this symposium through the Sheppy Dog Fund. Here we go, that he established. Thank you, Dr. Klein, for continuing to bring such wonderful lectures and events to the FIA. And he made all of the sessions here count, uh, free for admission, so we really appreciate that, Dr. Klein. Speaking of which, uh, the next Sheppy Dog Fun Lecture will be Wednesday, November 9th at 6 p.m. with Dr. James Tabor speaking on the search for the lost Shapira Dead Sea Scroll, was it genuine or a modern forger forgery? As always, Sheppy Dog Fund lectures are free. If you are not a member already or would like to upgrade your membership, today only we are offering a discount on memberships. And again, this was an idea um, supported by Dr. Alan Klein. Membership um, not only allows you free entrance into the um, museum, but also gives you discounts in the museum shop, which today, because we have all the books and uh, for the exhibition and books to sign and posters, is a, is a great deal for you to get your membership today. It also offers uh, free discounts in the uh, cafe, as well as uh, member previews, openings, things that are exclusive to our members. So if you have any questions, please see the front desk for details, and they will be happy to help you. This symposium is in conjunction with the Enchanted Exhibition, organized by the Norman Rockwell Museum. Its showing in Flint was made possible by Susie Thompson. Thank you, Susie. I don't know if she's in the audience right now, but thank you so much. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the citizens of Genesee County for the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Millage, which provides free entry to the FIA for Genesee County citizens. And of course, a big thank you to Huntington Bank for sponsoring Huntington Free Saturdays, which allows everyone beyond our county borders to free entry to the galleries on Saturday today. Thank you. for. This symposium will look at the history of fantasy illustration, as well as explore contemporary illustration with two artists featured in the Enchanted exhibition. Our guest speakers are uh, Alice Carter, who is the first session. The second session at 11 a.m. is Jesse Kowalski, who is the curator of the exhibition. We'll break for lunch from noon to one, and then at session three, we'll begin with Tony DiTerlizzi, and then at 2 p.m., James Gurney. Those are two artists who are fe featured in the exhibition. In order to get to in, right into each program and give ample time to our speakers, we have provided a printout of the bios of each speaker, so we won't go into each bio as they come up. Another note, if you brought in a large backpack or even medium-sized backpack, we ask that you please check it at the front desk before you go into the exhibitions. Um, normally we do that, but since we were just trying to get everybody in the, in the auditorium, um, we, some people came in with backpacks, so please check. We have lockers that um, you can put your backpack at. And, let's see, we also have books available in the gift shop, as well as posters um, available for sale. And from 3 to 4 p.m., there is going to be a book and poster signing outside the museum shop. And we have four people willing to sign, so it's going to be quite a cool thing to get, your, to get an autographed copy. Just as a quick reminder, please take a moment to silence all your electronic devices. 
First up, we have Professor Emeritus of San Jose State University and Norman Rockwell Museum trustee, Alice Carter, who will talk to us about the history of fantasy. Please join me in a warm Flint welcome for Alice Carter. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out, braving the road closures, and uh, being here for this symposium on fantasy illustration. I'm just going to turn on my computer here so I can read my notes, and then we'll um, get right started. All right. I'm waiting for PowerPoint to open here. I guess I should have done that. Here we go. All right, it's happening. There it is. On the side of the angels, fantasy illustration in the age of discovery. So we're going to get right started. And the first uh, artist that we're going to talk about is this man, uh, William Blake, British illustrator, poet, and mystic. He lived from, uh, during the age of the Industrial Revolution from 1757 to 1827, just to ground you in time. Uh, you might know his poetry better than his art, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, or Jerusalem, the unofficial national anthem of, of England. Did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green? You might know that. Uh, but we're going to talk about Blake the artist, and uh, that's a portrait of him on your left. And on your right is uh, one of his illustrations. People think it's God. It isn't God. It's Urizen. And uh, Urizen is a character uh, from Blake's imagination, and he is the embodiment of Satan. And Blake saw... Um, Genesis uh, in a different way than it's written in the Bible. He saw it as a fall from the spiritual world into the material world. And the dark force who uh, accomplished this is the man with the calipers there. That's Urison. So um, let me go here. What is... Uh, what is memorable about Blake, what is even more memorable perhaps than his poetry and his art, or what informed both his poetry and art were his visions. He had his first vision when he was four years old. He woke up uh, out of a dead sleep and began screaming. His parents rushed into his room. What was the matter? He had seen the face of God pressed against his window. Quite a vision for a four-year-old, but... Kids have night terrors, so um, I guess they figured that was, uh, that was what happened. But um, later on, maybe seven to ten years old, uh, there's, there's some debate uh, on, on which it is, um, he had another vision. And this one was, was less uh, apocalyptic than the last one. It was more ecstatic. What happened is he was playing around his London home, and he wandered into the hills, and all of a sudden he saw a tree, and this tree was populated by angels, these amazingly luminous angels whose, uh, whose uh, wings sparkled like stars. Well, of course, he was terrifically excited, and he ran home to tell his parents about this amazing thing he'd seen, and it was only his mother's intervention that uh, prevented him from getting beaten by his father who had no patience for a child who lied. So we're going to talk a little bit, a bit more about that, but I want to stop a minute on this picture and let you look at it. And uh, it's a, a kind of characteristic of Blake's work in that he put the center of interest in the center of the page. Um, his work was typically small and uh, meant, to be, meant to be seen that way. This is a watercolor 16 by... Uh, by 12 inches. And uh, thinking about his vision and then looking at this watercolor that he did many years later in 1805, uh, you can see that kind of luminosity. And, and that's what's important to know about Blake's work, that his artwork, it, it wasn't a convention or it wasn't contrived. It actually came 
from, from things that he saw in his mind. And I think that's what makes it so real. This, of course, is the angel rolling the stone away from Christ's tomb. And for the artists in the background, um, you can see how he framed it, the framing device of the angels, and then the light angel against the dark. And another thing to look for in Blake's work, um, he, he often used symmetry, but um, he didn't, what we call for you artists out there, you know, twinning, where you, where you do it raw character and it goes like this, or it's like that, the same on both sides, and it always looks stiff. And, and he always broke up the symmetry in his work, and, and that's something to, uh, to look for in it. Let's go back to look at more of his work. Look at these images. This is uh, the red dragon of the apocalypse, the red dragon and the women, woman clothed in the sun. And uh, uh, this, this is one of his more apocalyptic visions that he saw. And uh, they're both the same subject, but if you look at the one on the left, which is absolutely remarkable, um, you, you see the red devil who represents evil, and again, that symmetry that is not quite symmetrical. And uh, he is, in a sense, battling with the forces of good, represented by the woman clothed in the sun with her feet on the moon. I think you can see the feet, see the moon there? So, uh, and he's creating this wind with his wings that, that is disrupting her hair. I mean, it's just spectacular. You know, a little, little small um, piece. The other is also the red dragon and the woman clothed in the sun. And again, about that, ba breaking that symmetry. See those feet? That beautiful drawing of the feet as the dragon who appears to be twinning and stiff, steps forward, and it, that's what breaks that up. Anyway, um, uh, Blake's visions continued throughout his entire life. Um, people thought he was crazy. He, um, he, uh, he endured a lot of um, uh, reprimand and derision, not just from his father, but from the public in general. But the visions did not stop. And as I said, they were both ecstatic and apocalyptic. Uh, a friend who was there at the t point of his death reported that Blake passed away singing of the beautiful things he saw in heaven. So um, uh, the pieces that uh, came from the heart. I have one more to show you here because I can't resist because I love this one. And this one is the ghost, well, I didn't, I didn't shift. There we go, the ghost of a flea. Is this remarkable? This is eight inches by six inches. And um, one of the artist's friends encouraged uh, Blake to draw out his visions, and he, he did them in a book called Visionary Heads. But I think this is the most remarkable of them. And what happened is that, uh, um, Blake was sketching a flea, probably through a microscope, right? And he claimed that the flea talked to him and told him that it was inhabited by the souls, all fleas are inhabited by the souls of bloodthirsty men. So this is the soul of a flea. I, I think it's pretty frightening. Um, look, there's the, the bowl of blood, and look at him looking at it. Um, uh, so ravenously. Uh, but Blake saw this. He wasn't trying to create fantasy art. He, he saw this, and he needed to show it to others it the same way he needed to show that tree to his parents who didn't believe him. Again, if you're an artist or if you're a non-artist looking for ways to look at art, look at how he turned the back, even though it's a profile. You know, he has that twist in the torso, and also um, something that's very important for artists, uh, a clear silhouette. So today we characterize work like Blake's as uh, science fiction, or if it involves um, uh, apparatus, or if it doesn't, like this, as fantasy art. Um, but in their day, these pictures were an honest representation of a belief held not just by Blake who had visions, but by the general public, that uh, the visible world was only part of the story. 
So let's go to the next slide here. And I'm doing it twice here. So uh, during Blake's lifetime, uh, the, the first half of the 19th century, his work was largely ignored. And John Martin, this artist, uh, was England's best known artist. Um, today he's known as the father of modern cinema. And I think you can see why his, uh, his paintings were very cinematic. Um, both his illustrations and his paintings juxtaposed uh, tiny, terrified creatures with huge atmospheric effects. And what he was representing was a deeply held belief of his own that uh, man was, the man's power was maybe not what um, people thought it was, but it was very much um, uh, subservient to the power of nature, or if you want to say, the power of God. So um, this painting was so popular when it was first shown at the British Institution's exhibition in 1821 that they had to fence it off from enthusiastic crowds. The painting was big, five feet by eight feet. There are, all his paintings are, are quite big. And the subject you're looking at is uh, Belshazzar's Feast. And if you... Um, skipped out on Sunday school, what's happening here is uh, Belshazzar is holding a, a debauchery, a feast, and he is using the holy vessels from the Temple of Jerusalem. And in the middle of this party, um, a hand appears, and it writes something on the wall. There it is from the painting. The hand, that's where we get the phrase, the handwriting on the wall write something on the wall, and uh, no one knows what it is, and, and finally they call in Daniel. This is from the book of Daniel in the Bible, and Daniel reads it, and of course, as uh, many of you know, it uh, gives Belshazzar the bad news that um, his days are numbered, and the days of his uh, empire are numbered. So we'll go back to the main one. just so you can have another look at it. Um, this, this, uh, this subject was very popular at the time. Byron wrote a poem about it. Emily Dickinson wrote a poem about it. And, and there is a pretty terrible song by Johnny Cash, which you can access on, on YouTube, in which he calls Belshazzar Belshazzar, but very entertaining. And uh, just so you can see how different his vision is, this is a Rembrandt on the left of the same piece. And you can see Rembrandt's piece is very uh, homocentric. It shows Belshazzar the hero and the people looking amazed. And you can see the hand there, you know, in the corner, the actual hand writing. And uh, you can see the difference between uh, Martin's viewpoint. So um, we're talking illustration. So um, this is how the piece would have appeared in illustration. And that would have, that's how the common person might see it in a book or own it. That's a, a, an etching and a mezzotint. So something else interesting about uh, John Martin is that he was also a scientist. So all this great painting, uh, many of the artists in that day uh, were also scientists and interested in uh, scientific discovery. This is a plan that Martin did for the London Embankment. And the idea was to take the sewage that used to come into the Thames and divert it uh, into the, back into the fields for agricultural use. So you can see what a what a accomplished artist he was, uh, how how well he could draw and how well he knew perspective. Um, the the plan was put in uh, to use some twenty five years after um, after Martin did it. So um, Martin's philosophy and the reason he painted that it. He put together two opposing views that were popular at the time. And they're, they're the views of what I call the two Williams. And the William on the left is William Herschel, who in uh, 1781, he was the most famous man in Europe. And why? Because um, he was the first person in 2,000 years to discover a new planet. He discovered Uranus, and he, he discovered it with a homemade telescope in his backyard, 
And um, looking at the sky, his nightly sweeps of the sky convinced him that the universe had a, a beginning and also an end. And, and this was something new, an apocalyptic end where it would all um, dissolve into nothing. So um, th that was one, that was the kind of apocalyptic side of, of Martin's work because he believed that. And then there was another uh, uh, side of it, um, and that was the, the more uh, accepted side, the side accepted by the Anglican Church and, and by the Catholic Church and by religion, that um, the universe was a static dome in which the galaxy rotated and it, at the center and the stars were all rotating around this galaxy. And uh, that, that, um, that kind of theory was best represented in the period by the poet, also very famous, uh, the other William, William Wordsworth, who uh, once said he was willing to die for the Anglican church. And um, he assured his, his readers that um, uh, the stars were built by nature's hand and guarding over uh, humans, and, and we would return there. That was our natural home. And um, uh, so these two views, Martin believed them both. And he said, you know, why can't, why should what a man use one kind of logic for religion and another kind of for general affairs? So he believed in the science, and he, he was also a, a devout man and a believer in God. So that, that's where his paintings come from, so it may be easier to understand them. Uh, other artists did not like him. First of all, he was immensely popular, and um, uh, John Ruskin, who was English leading critic at the time, uh, said he described Martin's canvases as a reckless accumulation of false magnitude. I love that. I love the Victorian language. Uh, John Constable, the painter, compared them to lowbrow pantomimes. So uh, he didn't have a lot of support in the artwork, although Turner liked his work, and, and you can probably see why. But he was very popular with scientists. Uh, Michael Faraday was an admirer, William Buckland, and especially uh, George Cuvier, who's the, uh, Jim knows him, the founding father of paleontology. And uh, when Cuvier heard that, that Martin was painting this picture, the deluge, um, he traveled from France to England to check out the details to make sure that this was all accurate uh, uh, according to his studies, his scientific studies. So here's how the story goes. I don't know if it's true. We'll never know how it's true. But if you're a, if you're a teacher, you're welcome to repeat it. <laughs> um, um, uh, so Cuvier travels to England to see this painting and goes to Martin's house, knock, knock, knock. Martin isn't home, but he's let in by the housekeeper. And he goes into the studio, and this giant painting is there on the easel. And he, he looks at it, and, and he takes his boutonniere out of his, um, his waistcoat, and he places it with his calling card on the palette. And that is his indication to John Martin that he approves of this. So uh, this painting, again, extremely well re re uh, received. And um, it, was, it was to be Martin's last great triumph. And this is why, in a bizarre turn of events, his brother, with an um, unfortunately very similar name, Jonathan Martin, uh, goes crazy, and in uh, 1829, he sets fire to the York Minster Cathedral. And that's a picture of the York Minster Cathedral burning, and um, I will admit I colored it red just to make it look a little bit more like Martin's work, but um, people who saw this picture, they got the Martins mixed up, and John and Jonathan, and, and they felt that maybe it was John Martin, who had set fire to the cathedral. Meanwhile, John is spending every cent he has to defend his brother in court 
the defense was uh, successful. That's his brother on the left, in that his brother was assigned to the uh, Bedlam Psychiatric Hospital instead of being sent to the gallows. So it was, it was successful in that regard. So um, even though his work fell out of favor and uh, the crowds were not there, of course, um, John Martin, like William Blake, he believed in this. He believed in the science of it. He, he believed he was painting reality, uh, something that came to be called the apocalyptic sublime, the fact that the world was ending, uh, uh, headed for destruction, but that, that God was in the firmament. So he painted these paintings in a series of three, um, they were the la his last works, all six feet by ten feet, so they're huge, like the, like the equivalent of Victorian people going to the cinema. Uh, this one is The Last Judgment, and uh, this shows um, God in his throne and the bad people you know, falling into the abyss. And these are the good people in this side. And the interesting thing about the good people, if you were there and you could look at them up close and we weren't separated uh, uh, from this painting, you could see that there's little portraits of Thomas Moore and John Wesley and Dante, even George Washington, Copernicus, Newton, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Michelangelo, and Rubens, among others. So um, again, these were pieces very much from the heart this is the most frightening picture in all of art history, I think. This is the great day of his wrath, the, another in this series showing um, the destruction of the earth and, and the abyss into which the, the damned are falling. Look at the size of those boulders and um, really the beauty of that composition, all framed by the dark and then the light coming through in the middle. Um, Again, a very clear silhouette to tell the viewer what is happening. And, and these, um, these compositional uh, elements are, are used today in modern cinema where his, his work is, is greatly admired. And this one is The Plains of Heaven. And uh, as usual, like in comics, you know how the villains are always much more interesting than the heroes? Well. I, I think the the damned are much more interesting here than the saved, but um, here they are. So uh, there were these these three huge pictures and a mountain of debt. And so after Martin's death, his heirs uh, took these pictures on a tour. They went to England, all through England. Um, uh, they went to the United States, they went to Australia, and people were char charged admission to come in, like, a, like going to the movies and seeing these huge pictures. And um, uh, the paying customers uh, thrilled and terrified with uh, Martin's fantastic uh, view of humanity's final drama. So this, this just gives you a feeling of how big they are. This is how they were displayed at the Tate. And they, they did this thing with sound and music, which oh, I don't like, because I, I think Martin's work is best appreciated just silently looking at it and taking it in and, and knowing that um, it, it, was, it was someone who believed sincerely in what he was doing. Uh, he, he painted the universe as he saw it. So while Martin was, was doing these huge apocalyptic things, uh, England, regular people in England began to um, be fascinated with smaller miracles. Uh, development of cheaper lenses made microscopes available to the general public for as little as five pounds, and people went crazy uh, picking up little diatoms in, in puddles, little one-celled algae creatures. And this is the Victorian age, so of course, they arranged them into decorative patterns, uh, kaleidoscopic decorative patterns. It, they're beautiful, aren't they? A very, um, a very interesting and, and very Victorian uh, uh, pastime. And what they discovered, um, these little en enigmatic Creatures, they're neither plant nor animal, um, 
what they discovered was there was a parallel universe, too small to be seen by the naked eye. And th this was amazing. Can you imagine that? All of a sudden, the, the general public becoming aware of this. So um, this fact revived interest in a, in a theory called natural theology. And this was uh, put forth by another William, a lot of Williams in those days, and he's on the left there, uh, about the same dates as, uh, as William Blake, 1743 to 1805. And Paley, who many of you might know, um, was, was famous for uh, comparing the intricacies of nature to the intricacies of a watch. So. The, the story is this, that if you're walking along the beach and you come along, someone has dropped a watch, and you open the case and you see it inside, that it's absolutely spectacular, you don't assume that it generated itself. You obviously assume that there was a maker involved. And, and that was Paley's theory, uh, that was his proof of God, that um, it, the hinges in the wings of an earwig and the joints of the antennae are as hardly wrought as if the creator had nothing else to finish. Uh, we have no reason, therefore, to, to think that we are forgotten as humans, overlooked or neglected. So this was the, the, the theory of God in the world. And uh, the, a real revival in interest in that theory. Um, both by, uh, in religion and, and both by uh, the layman. So the, the gentleman with only one button button there is um, theologian uh, Charles Kingsley. And uh, he saw the, the possibilities of the microscopic world. He looked through a microscope, he saw this great world, and he, he combined that with... Um, with uh, the theory of natural theology that a maker had made this world. And uh, he told a lecture audience that uh, in the tiniest piece of fruit or decayed fruit uh, or a stagnant pool, uh, the imagination, you can see through a microscope, um, inexhaustible wonders. And he's called it a fancy fairyland. So, um, 17 years after he, he gave that talk, he turned to novelist and he wrote a novel called The Water Babies, which combined uh, Darwin's theory of evolution with a kind of a um, uh, tome about the Industrial Revolution in which a, a child, a chimney sweep, falls back into the water, a kind of reverse evolution, and is cleansed of, of his sins. Um, so what this did is uh, what the microscope did and people like Kingsley talking about a fairyland it, it miniaturized all the mythological creatures that had populated European mythology for hundreds of years suddenly they got small and you are about to see an um, a incredible painting here by Joseph Noel Patton and he was the artist that, uh, that Kingsley wanted to um, illustrate the water babies, and he did. But uh, this, is, this is one of his fairy paintings. And uh, John Tenniel wanted him to illustrate Alice in Wonderland, too. But he did not, as you know. I'm John Tenniel. Uh, Lewis Carroll wanted him to illustrate Alice in Wonderland uh, also. But... Um, he, uh, Carol counted 167 fairies in this. I'm not sure if, they, uh, if that's true. But this is a, a very erotic painting for the Victorian era. And what happened is that fairyland, uh, in the Victorian era when uh, women couldn't show their ankles and pianos had skirts to hide their legs, um, somehow it was okay in this alternate uh, universe to have all kinds of erotica going on. And it, this, this is a special kind of lily that's an aphrodisiac. And you can see people are um, having a lot of fun throughout this. This is uh, Oberon and Titania and the changeling child. That This is their quarrel 
uh, Titania wants to keep the child. Oberon says no. And uh, just a, an amazingly uh, crazy uh, painting. Um, and th this was serious art at the time. You know, this one, the painting of the year at the at the largest exhibition in Scotland. It wasn't, it wasn't for children, obviously, and uh, it, it was taken very seriously, and it, it was because um, uh, it, it, it was seen to have a basis in, in science. So on the left, you see Noel Patton, who did that last. This is his um, illustration for the water babies. <coughs> Still um, <coughs> a bit... Uh, uh, strange in nature, and of course this is John Tenniel for Alice in Wonderland, you know, much more childlike, just to um, uh, compare the two. So, uh, the premier artist of Fairyland um, was actually this man, uh, Richard Doyle, 1824 to 1883, and um, he was the uh, he worked for Punch for ten years? He designed that cover for Punch magazine. So you see all the little fairies and pixies in the border. They used that cover for over a century. That was the cover of, of Britain's usual uh, magazine of humor and political satire. And so you can see how important that fairy world was to them at that time. Um, this next slide is uh, from his book uh, uh, in Fairyland, which is, was, he, he was, a, if they're artists in the, in the audience, you'll understand, he, he was very um, uh, gifted, but he was also, uh, he also never got his work done on time and always had to be hounded by his clients. So um, <clears throat> he wasn't as prolific as he might have been had he not procrastinated. Um, but this is the triumphal march of the Elf King, and uh, whoops, I, whoa, stop, stop. Um, I, I, again, you can see how he used atmospheric pre uh, perspective in this lovely watercolor, and again, the clear silhouettes and, and the drawing ability, I think, uh, uh, good to look at. And then this next one from the same book, again, for children, but again, um, quite erotic with the fairies half naked. Um, one of the critics said that um, the book would be as popular with the, what did he say, used up and the disillusioned as the young. <laughs> so uh, those of you who know this period might be wondering why why did fine art not miniaturize? And this, of course, is uh, by Bougereau, Nymphs and Satyrs from 1873. And there was a very practical reason why fine art didn't min miniaturize. The way it was shown, it wasn't in books like uh, illustrators' work. It was in these uh, huge uh, salon shows where the paintings would be hung all the way floor to ceiling in galleries with ceilings like, like in the main gallery here. So um, the paintings tended to be big. But again, uh, the same kind of subjects, uh, very erotic. The Nymphs and Seder by Bougereau, and then in the next side, uh, uh, the Seder has taken them up on it. This is by uh, Cabanel. An exception to that was, was Turner, um, who uh, did paint them small, did miniaturize the, the fairy world, uh, had that influence of the microscope. And this is Queen Mab's cave, and uh, it's Turner. Uh, critics at the time said it looked like the painting. He flung the paint on the canvas. Queen Mab is in there somewhere. And uh, it's from Shakespeare. She's described as uh, no bigger than an agate stone on the finger of an altar man. So if you imagine her the size of a stone on a ring, you can see how, how small she was uh, supposed to be. Um, so next, uh, somebody you might know. And this is the strangest of the fairy painters and, and the people who did really believe in this miniature world. This is Richard Dad, and he lived from 1817 to 1886. 
Uh, he's painting a picture called Contradiction there, and that's, that is the finished painting there. And here's the story about him. Um, a very promising young artist, and when he was 25, he was selected to accompany a nobleman, um, Sir Thomas Phillips, on a, on a grand tour of Egypt. They ended up in Egypt. These are some of his drawings, his sketches, from when he was 26, 25 years old. So on this trip, um, suddenly he had a psychic break, and he felt like... Uh, he was the son of the god Osiris. And um, he felt like, since he was the son of the god Osiris, obviously his father was an imposter, perhaps the devil incarnate. So when he got home, he, he asked his dad to go on a walk with him. He's very argumentative and strange, and his dad went out on this walk, and... Uh, Richard Dad stabbed him in the stomach and then cut his throat and then fled to France where he was apprehended after he attacked someone on a ferry. And this is all true. <laughs> uh, art history is endlessly interesting. And um, uh, so he, he went to uh, uh, Beth, Bethlehem uh, uh, Psychiatric Hospital, known also as Bedlam, where uh, he... he re he lived the rest of his life. It, he was transferred later to another hospital called Broadmere, but he lived his rest of his life. Uh, Bethlehem was was notorious for their treatment of their, their their inmates. You can see terrible pictures of people chained to the wall and people who had suffering from mental illness. But at the time that Richard Dad was. Uh, committed there, uh, they, they, um, they had more gentle treatments, and he was actually allowed to paint. And good thing, too, because um, he, he did this painting called The Fairy Fellow's Masterstroke. We're going to take a minute with this painting. Um, he saw these things, he lived them, he believed in the microscopic world that science had discovered, and a lot of other things too, right? But um, it took him approximately nine years to paint this. Um, you might know this painting because uh, Freddie Mercury wrote a song about it, Queen wrote a song about it, the fairy filler. You, you can hear it on YouTube, there's endless renditions of it, it's, it's extremely odd. But uh, Freddie Mercury really liked this painting. It spoke to him. Um, so uh, this, again, is Queen Mab from Shakespeare. This is her microscopic wor world. And um, what this is about is this fairy fellow with the ax poised. He's about to crack a nut. I know you can't see it. I'm going to show you better pictures. So that's the nut somewhere down there. And he's, he's going to split that nut and um, uh, make Queen Mab's carriage out of it. And uh, he, he, there was a poem that, uh, that accompanied this, or uh, ramblings of someone who was uh, really having psychiatric problems. And uh, he says that the, when he splits that cell, he's going to unlock... Um, uh, the secret cells, uh, he's going to unlock the dark abyss in these secret cells. So um, that actually came to pass, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, we're going to look a minute at this remarkable picture up close, and that's the size of it, just uh, that's the basement of the Tate in London. So, um, and then this is some of the details that you can see it more closely. Up here, the apothecary, up here, that's his murdered father. So um, this is uh, somewhere there's a grasshopper blowing a trumpet. If any of you know the Queen song, he refers to that. And you can see Titania and Oberon there. And I think there's, there's here you go, there's Titania and Oberon. And I mean, you can see what an amazingly gifted artist he was. And... Uh, this is such a unique picture because it is, um, it is, it is something that he believed. Let's go to the next one here. So, uh, 
So this character in, in the middle, he is directing the action. And you see his hand there? I think I have a better one in the next slide. See his hand there? He is going, as soon as he puts his hand down there, the act will be done, and the, the fairy fellow will split that nut. And um, that, that had, a, according to a somewhat of an erotic connotation, that, um, that uh, dad felt that he had been shut out from life, shut out from nature, and shut out from life, and shut out from a sex life uh, in this institution. So we were talking about things uh, just among ourselves about uh, AI applications and things that help artists um, uh, work and, and using electronic media. And there, there's just no substitute for believing in what you are doing. And, and I think that's what constitutes great art is that individual vision and then all the study in back of that 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 makes that individual uh, mission realistic enough so that we look at it, suspend our disbelief, and, and believe in what's happening. That's, uh, that's fantasy art. For those of you who know the Queen song, this is a little satyr picking up, uh, looking, peeking under the cloak of the woman. I think uh, Freddie Mercury calls him a naughty laddie, unfortunately. <laughs> So um, let me go to the last one here. So um, you can see that even though he worked on it for years, he never finished it, which is interesting. This axe is not finished, and this is not finished. So the fairy fellow is, the, the, the guy is never going to drop his hand, and that nut is never going to be uh, split. And... Uh, Richard Dad is going to um, be shut out from nature's game and banished from the book of life for his entire life. So a very affecting, affecting piece. So we talked about him talking about the dark cells and the dark, unleashing the dark abyss of this miniature world. And uh, actually that happened because in the 1860s, uh, French chemist Louis Pasteur dis, uh, discovered that living organisms caused illness. And this was amazing. People didn't believe it. How could a tiny thing that looks so beautiful and kaleidoscopic, how could it cause illness? How could it bring down so, something so noble as God's chosen creature, man? And uh, they, they could not believe that these tiny creatures or germs were responsible for illness. Uh, Pastor, his, his successful vaccines for anthrax and rabies proved the point, or it tried to. Um, in 1886, uh, in New York City, they had four children who had been cured of rabies uh, from a vaccination, who had been protected from rabies through vaccination. They, they displayed them in a shop window, and 300,000 people came to look at these kids who had had been protected from, from rabies. So even though that happened, that the germs theory, well, just think of the pandemic. It caused more fear than hope. And people talked about um, germs uh, pressing out of broken drains, slipping under doors in the window sash and into the cribs of babies. And people were scared, and we can understand that, because if there's something happening that you don't know about, you're, you're scared. And uh, so um, this artist, American artist, Abbott Thayer, um, uh, he had lost two children to illness. He was a painter of grand manor portraits and these beautiful ethereal angels and uh, became so uh, afraid of these germs that he decamped to the New Hampshire countryside where he lived. He and his family lived in unheated tents and, uh, you know, in the middle of winter in New Hampshire. And um, uh, another interesting thing is that there was, he's not just, a, not just a, a painter who was not concerned with science. He was extremely concerned with it. He was a scientist himself and also one of the inventors of camouflage. 
So an interesting uh, thing about Abbott there. So on the other side of the Atlantic, um, those dark cells, the dark abyss, the, the flip side of the microscopic uh, world worked its way into art too. These are two drawings by uh, Arthur Rackham, uh, best known uh, illustrator of fairy tales in the last half of the 19th century. And he combined the, the beauty of the fairy world with some of the grotesqueness, some of the um, evil qualities, and made these uh, spectacular um, illustrations. So again, you can take a look for the artists, uh, the kind of framing device and the dark against light, the light against dark, and, and the very clear silhouette explaining this uh, maybe slightly inexplicable uh, uh, creature. Uh, the painter George Innes, who also, you'll see some of his work in just a second as we close this up, um, thought that Rackham's work was more fact, fact than fancy. He says, Rackham has really seen with his mind's eye these delightfully fantastic creatures. Um, Rackham was like a tennis player and very conservative guy and never talked about actually seeing these creatures, but he really, um, he really had to have an affinity to, to draw them like that. But there were some people who actually saw them, and these are two little girls um, in Cottingley, England, who uh, borrowed their father's camera and went out to the garden and took these photos that... Um, revealed fairies. Uh, I mean, to, to think that anyone believed this now, uh, that they weren't cardboard cutouts is amazing, but you have to remember that people at that time were not used to photography. This looked real for them. Arthur Rackham was one of the first people who called foul on this. He said they looked like his drawings. But um, actually, they were, the, uh, they were the drawings of one of his imitators. Claude Shepherdson. Um, and, and you think, okay, of course they were fake. But um, uh, other people believed they were real. And one of the people who believed they were real was um, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes. He, he you know, it sounds more like Watson than Sherlock Holmes, right? Um, he, he, this is what he said. These little folk who appear to be our neighbors with only some small difference of vibration to separate us will become familiar. The recognition of this, their existence will jolt the material 20th century mind out of its heavy ruts in the mud and will make it admit that there is a glamour and a mystery to life. So um, Doyle, he needn't have worried because... Um, the rational explanation of science in the 19th and early 20th century did not take the mystery out of life. It, it was like Newton said, uh, his third law, every astonishing scientific revelation birthed an equally uh, astonishing supernatural claim. So uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, you might be interested that the little girls who did the Cottingley hoax, they, um, it, uh, 65 years later, they admitted that they had used carded, uh, cardboard cutouts. However, the fairies, they said, were real. <laughs> so um, these paintings are, are by uh, the, uh, Samuel Morse. And one is uh, James Monroe, our fifth president, and the other is a self-portrait. And a very good artist, trained at the Royal Academy, but you might know him better as the man who invented uh, the telegraph and the Morse code. He, for those of you contemplating a career change, he didn't start working on that till he was 40. And, uh, um, but this invention, you know, when he sat down and, and did that first uh, message, what hath God wrought? wrought. Um, uh, that revived an interest. Talk about every empirical discovery, um, uh, uh, kind of um, jump-starting a new fantastic idea. Um, uh, 
it, it revived an interest in mesmerism and uh, the claim that people under hypnosis uh, uh, could be cured, could have prophetic visions uh, and contact with the spirits. Um, and, and also spiritualism, and that spiritualism differs from mesmerism. Mesmerism, you're hypnotized. Spiritualism, you're awake. And you have these visions in a state of wakefulness, like Blake did. And this, this uh, revived interest in this man, and this is the Swedish scientist philosopher Emanuel Swedenborg, who lived 1688 to 1772. Swedenborg, uh, you might know, is the uh, most interesting character. He was absolutely brilliant scientist. He wrote up plans for airplanes, submarines. He figured out how cells worked. He uh, he, he did all kinds of anatomical studies on blood flow. He did works on geology. He was like a Michelangelo Renaissance amazing man. And um, what happened to him at the height of his distinguished career in a state of perfect wakefulness, he visited heaven and hell and communicated with angels and spirits. And, and you know, he, he was not irrational during this time. He... He was not thinking that the uh, Egyptian god uh, ordered him to murder anyone. He, he actually um, saw this. And um, uh, there were, actually, there were some, some kind of miracles associated with this. Um, in one of the first, he was at some scientific organization. And um, uh, this is July 1759. He's attending this party. And suddenly he gets very agitated, and he says there's a fire near his house. Um, in, uh, I, I think he was in Jutaborg, uh, and his house was uh, 200 miles away, and turns out that there was a fire, you know, and, and it, it stopped like two doors from his house. Uh, some person had lost some valuable article, and he knew where it was and told her, and um, uh, he... This is also um, Sweden's, uh, Sweden's king, queen. She wanted to communicate with her dead brother, and he told her something that only her dead brother would have known. You know, it was these crazy things. And then uh, he was invited to a conference, and, and he, he told them, no, he would be dead by that day. And he predicted the exact date and hour of his death. So um, Swedenborg Borg had no desire to be a prophet or to have a religion founded in his name, but of course there was, because um, what, what this did was it showed people who were worried about science versus religion that, that there was this alternate world, that travel to heaven was in fact possible. Here was a noted scientist who had had done it. Um, this is this is just a, a slide by uh, Eugene Therion, uh, uh, Joan of Arc receiving uh, her her uh, revelation from the archangel uh, uh, Michael. Um, what what Swedenborg's uh, experience spoke to was Darwin's theory of evolution, which kind of shook up everything. And that idea is, is man an ape or an angel? But here was this noted scientist who, who was uh, affirming God's interest in man. And if you think, oh, this, who believed this? Again, a lot of people believed it and still do. Um, uh, William Butler Yeats was an admirer, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, uh, William Blake, who we showed first, was an admirer, and uh, most um, uh, also this person, this painter, we talked about him a minute ago. This is George Innes, uh, American painter, and this is the Valley of the Shadow, and it shows um, uh, a person uh, falling from the, leaving the, uh, the material world and going towards the spiritual world, which Swedenborg thought was uh, 
the fate of mankind. You're born um, fallen, like like Blake said, with Urison, you're fallen from the spiritual world into the material world where you experience trials, and uh, then you go back. So um, another follower of, of Emanuel Swedenborg was this man, illustrator Howard Pyle. And Howard Pyle is going to complete our 100-year journey into the influence of science on fantasy art. Uh, Howard Pyle completed more than 250, uh, 2,500 commissioned illustrations during his 35-year career. Uh, his best works bridged uh, reality with imagination and tales he wrote, designed, and illustrated, including Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, Otto of the Silver Hand, The Garden uh, Behind the Moon, and four volumes of the Arthurian Legends, published between 1903 and 1910. Uh, Howard Pyle's faith was tested uh, in 1899 when he was uh, he left his son with his sister, went to Jamaica to do some research, and uh, his son died unexpectedly. And uh, his faith in the, in the readings of Emanuel Swedenborg helped him through this period. Um, he said, death is so thin a crust that I can feel his heart beating just on the other side. So um, here he is with some of his students. And um, whoops, I'm advancing instead of pointing. Wait a sec, let me, let me, ah, I'm ruining it. Wait a sec. There I go. There I go. So um, here he is, and this is George Harding, for those of you illustration historians. Uh, Gordon McCouch, Thornton Oakley with the dark eyebrows there, uh, N.C. Wyeth, and Alan Tuppertrue. And um, his belief in this was so strong, the idea that there is, there is something more than the visible world. And he, this is the, the thing he wanted to teach to his students. And his goal was to, um, to start a uniquely American school that would not depend on classical tropes and paintings, like how you were supposed to paint, but you would project yourself mentally onto the canvas, your heart and soul uh, onto the canvas. And this is what was going to distinguish American art from European art and, and put it on the cultural map. So um, uh, uh, he did that with his students. He, he taught them that. And um, we're going to look at one of his works that talks about this. This is The Journey of the Soul. And I know it's a little bit difficult to see here, so we're going to go one by one. So this is what happens uh, in this picture. And what you see here is uh, the wicket of paradise, and here is the soul, this woman, and she is represented going through from the spiritual world into the material world, and you can see there is death. Death is always present, always waiting to, um, to return her um, where she belongs. And this next one um, is uh, the meadows of youth, and the woman is, she's seduced by love and life, and and everything is great, but um, you can see death is, is still present in the picture. This one is called the Valley of the Shadows, and, and you can see in this that um, she is uh, drinking from the bitter cup, that, that there has been someone is dressed in mourning, and she is drinking from the bitter cup. And then this one, which I think is maybe the most effective. This is at the gates of life. And you can see she has passed uh, into the spiritual realm back. Her life is over. That's her head right there. It's a little hard to see blasted out uh, in this big. But that is death. And he is, he's barring the, uh, the gate so that she can't go back. She's, she's now in this like Cerberus at the gates. So um, here's some pictures by Pyle students. And this tradition lives on and, um, and actually lives on today because uh, here this is Maxfield Parish. 
Um, this painting from the Boys King Arthur is by the middle one is by uh, uh, N.C. Wyeth, and the one on the right is by Elizabeth Shippen Green. And um, uh, we'll show you this next one first. This, this is another. This is Water Babies by one of reinterpreted by one of Pyle students, Jesse Wilcox Smith. Um, and you can see her Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater painting in the show. And um, if you think the tradition doesn't go on, uh, just take one look at me here. And um, uh, my teacher, who was Al Gold, oh, I t I've taught thousands of illustration students who've gone off into the industry. And my teacher was Al Gold, and Al Gold's teacher was Henry Pitts, and Henry Pitts' teacher was Thornton Oakley, and Thornton Oakley's teacher was Howard Pyle. So that's how this has um, gone down through, through many other students and teachers um, through the generation. So in closing, I'm, I'm just going to leave you with a, a story about um, Howard Pyle. This story comes from one of his students, Frank Schoonover. And uh, it, Pyle used to have his students draw outside a lot, and there they are drawing. And uh, this, as Schoonover tells this story, one beautiful afternoon, Pyle puts away his brushes. He's out drawing with his students. He dismisses his model, and he calls out to his students. This is in the Brandywine Valley where he had a school um, in Delaware. And he calls out to his students to follow him along this small stream. And uh, emerging from the shadows, they slog through this small stream. And emerging from the shadows, in the last of the light, there is a tree, like Blake's tree, shimmering in the last of this light. And Pyle says, look, look at it. It's a wonderful creation of a worker in metal, a great yellow thing with plate after plate of burnished gold towering up against the arch of heaven, all clothed in shimmering garments, standing there to reflect the good glory of the divine maker. If angels appeared, Pyle didn't say it. So thank you very much for listening, putting up with my dyslexia on the clicker, and um, thank you for coming.